final year of the twenties. Oh fuck yeah! Yeah. Yeah. I had a little bit um, about three weeks ago when I realised it was almost my birthday. I had a kind of like, oh god moment and then I've been using the last three weeks to kind of like ease myself into it so now today I'm fine with it it's fine but maybe next year when I turn 30 I feel like I'm I mean it's fine I, I understand it's you know not that old but you just kind of I do have a little bit of a wobble yeah well just remember that Jimmy's always going to be older than you this is it that actually does make me feel a little bit better and I know that's not fair on him but it, it kind of does like he he was 28 when we met so I'm only just a little bit older than he was it's kind of scary, isn't it? Like, yeah. I mean, I, I when I hit 30, I had a bit of a freak out about it. But then I was like, do you know what? I'm actually no different to when I was probably 20. You know, honestly, I've just got more grey hair. Yeah. I have no less hair. I just have grey hair now. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I don't know. I, I, it's, age is just a number, isn't it, at the end of the day? It is. It is, yeah. Yeah, this is it. I mean, like, I think... The only reason it freaks me out is I think, oh God, that sounds really adulty and I don't feel very adulty. But actually, like especially this year, I've done very adulty things. Like I got a house and we we got kind of semi married. Um, yeah, yeah, you did. Fake married, civil partnership. Um, fake marriage. No, it's it's legit marriage because it's a marriage that you uh, have wanted to do in a way that's out of church. That's right, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, you exactly. Don't go to church. So what's the point? Basically, yeah, you just sign a bit of paper. Yeah. So, in theory, this is recording, according to my... <laughs> it says it's recording, so we'll see. So, uh, I, with anyone that's been listening to the podcast, I'm trying something different now as well, where I'm actually recording the conversations with video. And Emily has opted to be the first guinea pig. Um the videos are going to be on my YouTube channel. The podcast will still be uploaded as podcasts as well. There's no, no separation there. Hopefully this works. If it doesn't, we fucked up. We tried to do this uh, uh, two weeks ago, a week ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had so many problems with audio. That wasn't even trying to do video. We just had so many problems. We were both just like, let's just stop. Um, so, and then since then, I've decided that we'll try and do video as well, just to offer uh, another something a bit different so you can see my ugly mug a lot. Looking, still looking fucking shattered. I still look shattered. Um, I didn't sound as shattered though. Um, no, last time we spoke, you sounded absolutely knackered. Yeah, that would have been, that was within the first week of me finishing. And then since then, you guys have launched your autumn winter stuff which sold out which is a bit crazy yeah, yeah it did it's been i'm knackered now i <laughs> probably sound more knackered than you now um it's been a it's been a um i mean fantastic but just um we get a little bit surprised every time every time we <laughs> do it i guess because because it is just the two of you you're in this position aren't you where you don't want to over like buy loads of stock and then be sitting on stock and then you know that that causes the potential product being wasted manufacturing being wasted stuff sitting on shelves like it's taking up space there's like a lot of kind of negatives to ordering too much so it's like there's a very fine line and i guess because you know as a brand that's growing it's like it's this weird tricky point that it's like we don't you don't really know exactly what the demand is because every year is different and especially this year where it's been so up for grabs and so weird it really changes things i guess Absolutely. I think you've hit the nail on the head. Um, cycling kit is a terrible business to go into. It's, it's Stuff's expensive, it takes ages to make, and it's seasonal. So you've kind of got a double whammy, which means like if you're not backed by hundreds of thousands or millions of pounds, which we aren't, then you, you have to be very, very um, cautious, sensible, um, not too cautious about how much you, how much you buy. Um, and yeah i think that i mean you never know what's going to happen year to year and uh, this is the thing at the point that we bought this stock we put our order in yeah. it was it was only a couple of months into summer so which was kind of we were still kind of in the middle of a pandemic so we were like do we know what's going to happen at the end of the year do we know we put our order in early because we didn't know whether there was going to be a second wave and obviously italy was hit so badly the first time yeah like we kind of just need to get something in soon um 
So, I mean, try not to play it too cautious, but you just, you have to be sensible with stuff. And as you say, you know, stock on shelves for, for a small business kind of doesn't, doesn't really work. It would so badly impact what we could then do um, in spring and summer next year, if we were left with so much stuff unsold that, yeah, you have to play it, you have to play it safe while also managing people's expectations, because obviously it's crap when, when stuff sells out, if you're, you know, they're waiting to buy stuff and it sells out, it's also not good either, which is mm. why, yeah, we, we never really wanted to do pre-orders and we don't want to get into a routine of constantly doing pre-orders that they're, they're a bit of a back-end nightmare to manage as well. So we, we end up having a lot more work at the back end. Um, but yeah, it's balancing how much we can buy with also, you know, it's obviously amazing that people want uh, are invested in our brand and want to support us as well. So we want to be able to give people the opportunity to do it too. So yeah, I think it's, it's working out all right so far. It's just been a weird year, hasn't it? Yeah, there's so much stuff up for grabs in 2020. Like, we just do the best that you can. That's the only thing anyone could do at the moment, I think, is do the best you can. Um, I've also just noticed that we're both wearing exactly the same top. <laughs> I know, I was going to say that as well. <laughs> I, yeah, I literally went into, my, it was the first thing I grabbed out of the, the chest of drawers. I was like, that would do. Yeah. Nice. Um, Let's so get into big, it, shall we? Yeah, so the big thing today was for you to take over and we'll similar to what we did with uh the previous the last podcast which was bloody ages ago now mm. um for you to do a bit of a wrap up on what the hell happened two and a bit weeks ago for the last three weeks yeah okay well how about you start i'm guessing everyone who's tuned in probably knows uh to some degree what happened but for anyone who doesn't do you just want to recap what the challenge was yeah, so I uh, stupidly decided to cycle 107 miles every day during the Tour de France. Um, that was uh, leaving my flat in London, uh, riding to Land's End, where there's no freaking sign, and then going up to John O'Groats, uh, kind of cutting on the uh, east, western coast, so going a bit through the Lake District, uh, Carlisle, Edinburgh, John O'Groats, and then turning back down pretty much the same way until Edinburgh, where I went then across the eastern coast, came by where you guys are, and then cut in through the Peak District, and then took the long way back to London, going to the most uh, eastern point of the UK before turning back into London. So it was 20 days of riding, 107 miles minimum every day uh, during the Tour de France to fundraise for the Pace Centre and the 107 kids and their families that go there. Awesome. And and the Pace Centre, it, it's somewhere that you've been fundraising for for quite a few years now, which, what was the first challenge? It was the Richmond 24, right? Yeah, that was 2016. Yeah. 2016 was riding around Richmond Park for 24 hours. Um, so Pace is a school for kids with motor-based disorders, uh, so things like cerebral palsy, and they, they have two, co- like two sites. There's a, uh, a, like a primary school site uh, and then there's a newborn site and they're basically the idea they sort of live on this sort of uh, methodology of trying to encourage these kids to really be able to do whatever they want and whatever they can go to university go to secondary school try and have as much of a normal life as possible and with the the sort of newborn site it's about sort of understanding uh, motor-based disorders at the earliest possible opportunity because that's not really a thing that is done very much in the UK and internationally in fact and um, the first challenge I did was riding around Richmond Park for 24 hours, and that was in 2016, which was then subsequently followed by riding 107 kilometers every day for 107 days, which was 16 to 17. I did that in the winter, started in December and finished it. Yeah, 16, 17. And then I sort of had to, I don't know, for my own sanity, I guess, I had to take a bit of a break away from it. It, did, it still was involved very much with the charity, but needed to kind of do some other things um and I would always had it earmarked that this year was going to be uh, a time that I was going to do something for pace which uh because of the connection to the Tour de France with being the 107th edition obviously what I wanted to plan originally is nothing like what I actually ended up doing but I think probably made a better challenge out of it from what I actually ended up doing to be honest with you it meant a lot more people could get involved with it 
Yeah, I think that was the nice thing about it. it uh, the fact that you were kind of going to all of these sort of locations, um, it meant that it was very easy to find where you were to kind of to come out and join you at a safe distance um, and probably made it quite tough as well, I guess, especially with, you know, the British weather. Um, that's, I guess in one sense, that's kind of what these challenges are about. You, you don't want it to be easy. You're purposely planning stuff that is difficult and not only was the riding challenging, but the weather was challenging as well. And that kind of adds a, a little extra element. Yeah, I mean, the weather was, especially as I got to Scotland, was biblical. It was every, I think every day, if it wasn't a thunderstorm, it was a hailstorm. And if it wasn't a hailstorm, it was a very, very strong, if it wasn't even them, it was a very strong headwind. Um, but that's part of the parcel, you know, with, is doing it at a time of the year where the weather is unpredictable. You know, uh, you know, end of August, September, majority in September, you're very, very much at a point where, in the UK, you're you're bound to hit very bad conditions at points. Um, and riding over a course of day, you know, twenty days, the chances are you're not going to have good good weather every single day. So it, you just had had to kind of mentally prepare for that. I think the thing that maybe caught me off guard was actually the amount of days that were cold. Um, and I would, you know, be fully wrapped up, arm warmers, leg warmers, gilet, wearing a down jacket at points. Um, that probably caught me off guard a bit, but it, it did mean that when the days the weather was really good, I, you know, I took advantage of that and enjoyed it. Um, you have to have the highs and lows of everything at the end of the day, I guess. Yeah. Um, so let's let's sort of delve into the challenge a little bit more. So we can almost talk about it in blocks. So I would say the first block is probably London from your house out to the southwest. So tell us kind of what happened in that, those first couple of days. That was probably the hardest week I've had on a bike, to be honest. Um, so the, what people probably don't think about the southwest of the UK is the climbing is relentless there. Um, if you don't have a, if the climb is not above 20%, I wouldn't have classed it as a high climb there. So there, regularly, it was over 20%, just continual, you know, boom, 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 like a saw. And that first block, which is like London, I, I'd sort of class it like London to, um, to Land's End and then back up to Bristol was like that first block. And uh, my coach, Ken, did some like geeky number, number statting. And he, for anyone that knows like training peaks and stuff, he worked out that I did... 2100 over 2100 tss in that first block and most people would struggle to sustain 1000 tss that's quite that's a tons so what that equates to in, as like as a way of explaining it a bit more layman's terms is doing like three one hour max time trialing efforts a day for a week that's like what it equates to which is it's just grim it's really grim um the, uh, it's quite well known that on the Land's End to John O'Groats that the southwest is, everyone knows that's the tough bit of doing Land's End to John O'Groats. It's always known as being the really undulating part. I remember like the, the first day, which would be London to kind of, uh, you know, like near Stonehenge basically, was maybe not so much climbing in the start of the day, but definitely towards the latter end of the day. And then progressively, the further west I went, the more relentless it got. And I remember at points, uh, especially like near... Uh, Dartmoor thinking I've got to go back this way up this climb which happens to be about that wide with gravel on it um, and it's definitely maybe 30% and I just remember thinking shit <laughs> um, so those I mean the, the, the lucky thing was the weather was pretty good for all of those days which I think if the weather was bad it would have made it incredibly hard um, I was quite lucky on that sense that um, I didn't really have much bad weather apart from the day riding into Bristol. Um, but I think I got to Land's End on the third day. Third? Yeah, it sounds, I think it's the third, roughly the third day, uh, very early in the morning. And then because of having to hit this distance target, basically I stopped at Penzance the night before, which is very, very close to Land's End, but ended up going. I need to stop here because I, that's as close to the, the number, the 107 miles as I could get to. And then I end up riding basically to Land's End and just turning back on myself, which is actually quite mentally quite demoralizing because you get somewhere and then you're just turning back on the same dead road. 
Um, but from, you know, pretty much from London, I think every single day of that first five day block, I had someone with me at, at points and intervals. And it was a mix of people I, I had never met before and a couple of people I knew, um, which really helped actually, because it was tough. It was really, really tough that first block. Uh, then the day coming into Bristol, which would have been starting at the bottom of Dartmoor National Park, literally, the ele- if this is this is where I was staying, the elevation just went boom, straight from the off gun, and I was with uh, my friend Liam, and he'd he'd got to the hotel to basically to ride with me, and he'd come. He said I'd be there at like seven, half seven in the morning. He's getting a lift there before work. And I was like, I, I can't have breakfast until I think it was eight. Uh, but so I, I had this thing. I always I had to make sure I had breakfast, obviously, because I'm riding such big distances. And so he waited for me in the lobby while I was having breakfast. And then literally I, I ate it as quick as I could, got changed, and we left. And we're going straight up into Dartmoor National Park. I remember thinking, I'm going to throw up. I'm going to throw up. I'm definitely going to throw up if we carry on riding this hard. And I looked at him and I was like, Liam, we need to slow down because uh, literally breakfast is here and it's going to be here in a minute and he was like cool no problem so he slowed it right back and Liam Liam rode with me just past uh, Exeter and then I did the, sort of the last stretch of that day on my own but bumped into a couple of guys again uh, but it got to this was the first time I think probably during the challenge where me and because I, I made it very clear from the start that I had a certain pace that i needed to ride to not necessarily speed pace i had like a pace in my head like power pace like not to go too hard not to go too easy at the same time because i still need to get to destinations but basically i got to um i got to this point where i had a couple of guys with me it was the first time where i kind of had to stick to my guns on it and they sort of were like it was raining we'd got to the top of a little climb just before she had a gorge and it was raining and i was like they would stop to put their jackets on and i was like guys no offense, there's 30 miles to go. I'm not stopping to put my jacket on. I'm just, I'm going. And I was like, if you catch me, cool. But I, 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 I don't want to stop because me putting the jacket on, that's like, a, that's going to be a 10 minute delay. And I'm already wet. I'd rather keep moving and stay warm than put the jacket on. And they, they were very respectful of that, to be fair. They completely understood it. And sort of, uh, one of them caught me up and the other one, unfortunately, I didn't see again. Um, but that was like that kind of, it was quite good to have had that because that was a fair, well, one of the first points where I really had to stick to that sort of rule and put it out there quite bluntly to people. Uh, but as I, I went up Cheddar Gorge, and I've never done Cheddar Gorge when it's been dry, ever. And it's a beautiful climb. Like if you're ever that way in the UK, stunning climb, try and do it like really early in the morning because it's quiet that way. But got there, I was going up it, it's thunderstorming at this point got to the top and I, I know where I am kind of from Cheddar Gorge. Um, and so I started descending it. I still did hadn't put a jacket on, had a gilet on, had arm warmers on, just carrying on getting on with it. The thunderstorm's going a bit nuts. Um, and I got to where I was staying in Bristol and I was just like, that was shit. That was a shit block. That was a really shit block. It was really hard. There's like, there's no, there was no easy way of putting it. It was just fucking hard, really hard. Mm. And I, I I, when I got to Bristol, I was like, because I tactically, I think I said it last time, I, I knew this first block was going to be tough. I tactically put in a rest day, which was not one that fit the Tour de France, but the idea was to have that as a rest day and use that as the, that rest day as a sort of one recovery and go for a little light spin just to keep the legs sticking over like some of the riders are doing the TT of the Tour de France. Um, I was so fucked. I was so fucked when I got to Bristol. I pretty much spent the, that day sitting on the sofa with my feet up, sleeping. Um, it was the hardest, probably the hardest five-day block I've had on a bike, I would say. Wow. Probably. And did you know it was going to be that hard right at the start? I knew it was going to be very hard. I maybe didn't know it was going to be that hard. Um, it's some. You know, you, you can look at like the stats on paper, like elevation, distance, gradients, and all that, and you, you kind of have an idea. But I never, I didn't, don't think I really thought it was. You don't know how hard it is until you do it, and also having a loaded up bike takes a diff, puts a different aspect onto it. So, the distance of riding across Australia, which was basically this time last year, uh, 
the elevation of that whole ride, which is Perth to Melbourne, I did more than that in the first four days of the challenge. I says a, that, I mean, Perth to Melbourne is far if you look at it on a map. And the elevation I did was more than that, which is, yeah, it kind of explains how hard that block was really more than anything. I, and I just was just like, I, I, I knew it was going to be tough, but I maybe didn't realise quite how tough it was going to be. Yeah, that's the UK for you. Um, it, you also mentioned last time, which I had no idea of, when you got to Land's End, there's, there's actually no sign. Or there is a sign, but it's, it's privately owned and you have to go and wait in line and pay to get your picture taken. I'll be honest, it's a fucking joke. It's a fucking <laughs> joke. So you get to, when I'm looking, I'm just putting the route up on my phone so I, I can remind myself where I went because it feels like ages ago now. So when you get to Land's End, because I got there quite early in the morning, Basically, there's where the sign is, it's like fenced off and there's a little shed where there's a man sitting there and there's the big sign everyone sees, which has all the arrows going like New York, London, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They take it away. And because I got there early, the sign wasn't up anyway, but they take, they literally take it away and put it away. And there's like a little shit sign, which looks like, you imagine like an estate agent sign, Yeah. With just two arrows on it, one saying John, it's one, it says Land's End in the circle. It's the one that the photos were taken at. And it is not a good sign at all. Like it's crap in comparison. But they charge you £12 to have your photograph taken with the sign. And you're not allowed to have, you're not allowed to take the photos. Their photographer has to take the photos. But the sign wasn't, the sign wasn't even up when we got there. So it was just like, I remember getting there thinking, well, this is fucking shit. Let's hope that John O'Groats and Lowescroft is not the same problem. Um, so yeah, we got, it was just like, it was like this massive anti-climax. I've ridden for like four, well, three days, four days at that point. And I was just like, well, that sucks. I feel like that is just peak capitalism, isn't it? Oh, it's just bullshit, isn't it? It is absolute <laughs> bullshit. And yeah, I was, I was quite disappointed. Like I just didn't, I didn't think it was, I was, yeah, I just felt like that. I was really disappointed in Land's End in general. It felt really touristy and like, it should be like an amazing landmark, really, like a, you know, like a something run by the National Trust, not a place where there's a freaking Wallace and Gromit land or something like that, because like, there was. And yeah, I was just a bit like, oh, this is Land's End. I'm not going to come back here again then. So not a great review on the TripAdvisor on that one. <laughs> no, I would probably give it two stars and to do, only get two stars because there was sunshine at the time. Fair enough. Yeah. It's better than up north. Anyway, yeah. right, so second second leg was sort of north of Bristol, I guess, all the way up to the Scottish border. So going from Land's End up to John O'Groats. Yeah. Um, so that second leg was basically, as you say, from Bristol. Uh, I cut a little bit into Wales through, and then cut a bit into the Peak District and then through the Lake District to uh, Carlisle. And then from Carlisle was basically the Scottish border. So... Carlisle is a, an interesting place in its own right. I've never been there before. I actually thought it was Scotland. It's not. Did you? <laughs> yeah, I did. I mean, it's so north to what I'm used to. I was like, Bloody well, southerner. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was like, oh yeah, that's got to be Scotland. But it is very close to Scottish borders anyway. Um, yeah. Shows that my geography A-level uh, did not help me there. Um, so these days, uh, what can I say about them? I had a really because I know quite a few people in Bristol I had quite a group of people ride out from Bristol which was really really cool went over the one of the main bridges that sort of cuts into Wales so I literally did cut into Wales for about half an hour it's kind of cool ticked off Wales um, and then carried on sort of trudging along heading north and the bit that kind of got me with this sort of section was the climbing wasn't so bad compared to the first block the first block was just relentless but it was still it was still, there's still a lot of climbing, you know, still cut into the Peak Districts a bit. Then you kind of, then after that, it was going through Manchester. And then after that, you're basically going into the Lake District. And the Lake District is just pretty relentless anyway. And the Lake District day, of course, it had to rain in the Lake District. Of course. I mean, of course, it absolutely went for it in the Lake District. Um, and I was with Toby, my mate Toby, and he was like, where would you like to stop for lunch? And I, so I, I got this. I got got it in my head that I didn't like to stop really until I had, like, I don't know, forty miles to go. 
I just right. had it in my head. It's like 40 miles or less. That's when I'll stop for lunch. Normally, because of when I was starting riding, that would be between one and two o'clock, generally. And that day in the Lake District, it just absolutely battered it down. And Toby was, and I, I got to this point with the bike that I needed to replace the brakes. Like I, The brake pads were knackered from... I hadn't put new brake pads in the start. I, I always, you see so many people say like, oh, I put new tires on before these things. I put new brake pads in, all this sort of stuff. And I don't because I know that the previous ones, I'm just going to throw them away and, and it's waste. So I'd rather use them up. And I always knew on this challenge that there's always going to be bike shops across the UK. So I can always stop somewhere to get some brake pads or stop to get new tires, which I had to do. Like it's, it's not, it's not a big issue. If I was, say, doing like Atlas Mountains again, I would have put fresh brake pads in, fresh tires from the start. But on this one, I was like, well, if I change the tires from the start, I'm going to chuck them away. I'm not going to put a new set of tires back on, really. And same with brake pads. So anyway, we got to uh, up into the lakes, and as it was actually hammering down, uh, Toby was like, oh, there's a good bike shop here, wheelbase. Um, if you need anything, you can pop in there. There's also a bakery around the corner. I was like, tactically, this is perfect because it's absolutely hammering it down. Um, went into wheelbase. They were super, super helpful. Um, got some brake pads. I had a spare set on me anyway, but the, I couldn't undo the through axle. Just sods, sods law, couldn't undo it. So went in there and they helped out with that. Um, and it, the reason was because I only had a, a tool, like a tiny little tool. I couldn't get enough leverage on it. Right. Um, and then while it was hammering it down, we decided to go to this bakery and have lunch. And eventually it started to stop. But I, I, I was finding during this challenge as it went on and on and on, I was, my anxiety was through the roof. And it was getting worse and worse. And every single day it was getting worse and worse and worse. And that was all these what ifs going through my head. What if this happens? What if this happens? What if I don't make it to this point? And because... Like I, I've said to you before, like a lot of the time when I plan stuff, I'm counting things out in my head. Like we talked about it when I did like the National 24s. I break it down into hours. I break it down into half hours, all that kind of stuff. So I'm doing the same in this challenge. We're like, okay, it's 107 miles. I'm going to break it down by this, this, and this. And can you hear that? Yeah, what is that? That's winds running through my flat. It's really is weird. It? Yeah. it sounds like music. It's weird as hell, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, so... I, I I got to this point where like I'd stopped earlier than I thought I was going to stop and it was like just jarring me in the back of my head and so I was really keen to get riding again. Eventually got back on the bikes as the, the rain started to sort of get a bit less heavy. Um, the big problem was like it's not I don't mind riding in the rain the problem is always like it adds another element of like potential crashing skidding out all these additional risk risk points that could happen and like on a challenge which is over so many days you want to try and minimize that as much as possible and i was going up um uh some massive standard lake district climb can't remember what one now um it's not the struggle but it's the one that runs along that finishes at the same point as the struggle basically um but I, it's a climb that i i love it i love the climb it's beautiful but the descent is also stunning so that was kind of why i put it in the route and also, I, you know, with this route, I didn't ride the standard Land's End to John O'Groats route. I rode the Land's End to John O'Groats route on crap, which was uh, me going, how can I make this as hard as possible for me to challenge me as much as possible? Because if I'm fucked, more people will donate. That was very simple, very simple logic to my, to my madness, really. But I think a lot of people thought, oh, he's doing this, you know, he could make it easier for himself. And I was like, well, that's not the point. It's not supposed to be easy. It's supposed to be hard. Um, another thing to say probably is, as I think I spoke about previously, is the whole thing, the, the challenge was filmed and documented uh, by basically Savello wanted to make a film about it. But very, I was very strict to the guys filming. This is self-supported. You don't help me. And... They were very good to that, actually. They, they weren't with me all the time. They were with me from London to Land's End. And then the next time I saw them was Blackburn. And they did from Blackburn to John O'Groats. And then the next time I saw them was the last couple of days back into London. So 
the idea was to be able to, it took a, a stressor away from me and having to think about how I was going to document it and record it and share the journey. Um, when they weren't with me, I was using like a little GoPro sort of camera. It's not GoPro, it's a DJI, brand drop, whatever. Other brands are available. There's loads of them, but everyone knows GoPro, so it's easy to say that. Um, so I was using that just to like document like people I was riding with and what was going on in the day as well. So they had all that additional footage. But the the what I made it very clear to them from the start was it, it was self-supported. Like if something happens, unless it's an emergency, don't get involved. And they were very good to that. But it meant that in an emergency situation, I had a large like first aid kit, like some spare kit in the back of the car, like essentials if something went wrong. Um, and yeah, that was but it's meant that the whole thing was documented and recorded. And in the, the Lake District, the guys have got me going up some climb. They were basically filming me going up some climb. And I was just thinking, I've been down this climb and this was hard to go down because it was quite sketchy and quite steep. And I'm going up it and I was just thinking, fucking hell. And I've got a freaking man sitting with a camera on me right now going, it looks like this is shit, Chris. And I was like, because it really was. It was really hard. <laughs> and he's, and uh, yeah, so that kind of block up to Carlisle, would, I'd probably say was, it was easier than the first block, but it was like the first point where the weather really started to play effect into it. And I kind of, meant I knew to buckle up and get ready for what was gonna happen getting into Scotland, which was yeah. tough. We talked about this beforehand, and so, so it said like, the West Coast is just so much wetter. Yeah. Just like, that's why if you look at a map of the UK, the West is kind of like got jaggedy bits out of it and stuff because it just gets all of the weather. Yeah, yeah. That was always probably going to be somewhat expected. That it was yeah, just we always knew we we know that the Lake District is wet in the UK, so it was kind of expected. I mean, the the stretches that were going from like you know Manchester, which cut into the Peak District, so I sort of went through uh, went bang through the centre of Birmingham, Wolverhampton. So the side of Stoke-on-Trent, and that's when I kind of cut into the Peak District. I then went straight through Manchester. I've never really been past like the bit of Manchester I did, so it was kind of interesting. It was like going past like Manchester City Football Stadium and all their crazy, like insane amount of like training centres and stuff there. That was kind of cool. And then took very much a turn towards the west coast, so going towards Lan Lancaster, which is where my uh, dad grew up so that was quite nice to go back through there again and then as I say straight through the Lake District to Carlisle which was the finishing point for that kind of block and um, had a, a really like nice sort of crew of people going through the Lake District to Carlisle which was really really nice as well I, I didn't um, I didn't really expect it um, but every day it was like a consistent like people but what a lot of the time what people kept saying to me is they were like, oh, we would expect you to have loads of people with you. And I was like, well, people just sort of drop in and drop out and depending on when they were, you know, what was close to them, which was absolutely fine. And it was great to have a bit of company, a bit of a distraction, you know, that all those kind of bits really, really helped with it. Yeah, I can imagine it's kind of a big, a big part of a, of a challenge like this when you're spending so much time on the road. The company, I guess, means a lot, doesn't it? Yeah. How many people did you end up having with you roughly each day? Um, I think there was maybe, there was a couple of days where I did ride on my own all day um, of the 20. I think there's three or four days on my own the whole day. But generally, um, I think the biggest day, which was before the restrictions came in of the limit of six, was maybe maybe eight or 10 people. And that was the day after Bristol. So the, the, yeah, the day six on the bike would have been that one. And then I think averagely, I mean, two or three, which is quite nice. Um, generally probably no more than four, 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 three or four is probably the average I'd say. Um, but as I say, it was very much, it was like intermittent. And I think people also, what, I mean, for me, what was really nice that people were really respectful of the fact that at points, I just didn't want to talk. I was, I, I'm, I was knackered, you know, I was really exhausted. And people really respected that. Um, and same if I was a bit grumpy, because I was grumpy at points, as anyone would be. Um, people were very understanding, which I, I, I was quite concerned that people maybe would not, you know, kind of expect you to like 
be really jolly and happy all the time. And I was like, well, I, I can't be because I'm fucked. I'm exhausted. So it's quite pleasant that people were quite like, okay, we'll just let him get on with it. You know, no one was really horrible in any way. That's good. Um, right, so the next section is Scotland, I guess, up to John O'Groats and, and back round. Yeah, so from Carlisle up to John O'Groats, you're kind of going from Carlisle, uh, a cut into Edinburgh, through Perth, through basically through Inverness, up to John O'Groats, and then it's pretty much the same way back to Edinburgh again. So that would have been... To Edinburgh twice? Yeah, a cut through Edinburgh twice, basically. Oh, okay. So I, I, I had my last rest day in Edinburgh. The, the day that I cut through it the first time, it's just like literally cut on the outs, outskirts of it. But I had my like last rest day, which is day 14 in Edinburgh. Um, it's pretty crazy when you think, basically from Carlisle, that's five days of riding Scotland. Scotland's a lot bigger than people think. A lot bigger than people think. It's very big. Yeah, it's fucking huge. Um, so the first day, which was the Carlisle day, kind of to just north of Edinburgh. Um, I had, I had like, a, it was basically a tailwind. It was the only day on the whole thing where I had a tailwind for the whole day. And I had a group of guys with me who were all, you know, big, burly, strong Scottish men. It just like, and we just like rode through and off all day. It was, that was a really good day, really fun. Everyone worked together. Everyone just rode at a good pace. And it was basically a tailwind the whole day. So it was super quick. I think we were done by like two o'clock. It was crazy. It was a crazy, crazy quick day. Um, we stopped at like some little very famous shop, which was called the Apple Pie Shop. And uh, had apple pie. Um, it's like apparently a really well-known shop uh, near Edinburgh. Like a little uh, country shop. And they... Um, an apple pie and the guys were like oh you need to have a macaroni pie and try all these weird like local things i was just like fucking out what the hell is this it was like it was a macaroni cheese pie apple pie and scones that were like as, literally as big as my head and as soon as i got into scotland we were joking around i was like i need to get iron brew somewhere so got some iron brew and um, so yeah that day was glorious like it was one of those days where i did it was just fun it was just fun it was a really fun day with a good group of guys didn't really have to think about it. The road, the, the, most of the road was basically an A road that ran parallel with the motorway. So it was super, super quiet, but big, wide, and really like, just quick, really quick. The uphill on it, I remember saying to the guys, this is one of them up downhill uphills, isn't it? Because it just felt fast because of the tailwind. Um, so that was a great day and the weather was pretty good. They couldn't get their hand around the fact that I was wearing arm warmers and a gilet. So I was like, it's pretty chilly, but apparently it was a summer day, according to these guys. Um, and then so from there, it was basically, so say, just north of Edinburgh to Abermore. Um, this day was, wasn't fun. Um, the first part of that day was, was actually really stunning. Um, cut through like a lot of little sort of villages there a really like nice part of the you know just nice little villages and towns but basically this was the first point which is sort of from pit lockery where you sort of started to turn and run parallel to one of the big a roads which goes to basically to john o'groats and at points you're you are on this a road because there's no other road which really goes around it just so happens the bit i was riding on Apparently, quite a lot of cyclists ride it, but it is a fast bit of road. The um, ironic bit is the fast bit of road had loads of roadworks on it, so actually it wasn't too bad. Cars were going slowly and was actually overtaking cars at points. But as you kind of snake around this bit of road, you're starting to go like along the Cairngorms, I think it's called. Like the yeah, Aviemore's in the Cairngorms, I think. Yeah, so you're starting to go around the Cairngorms, and there's basically the main a road and running parallel to that is the old a road which is now pretty much a cycle lane so that bit of road is that that so the you've got the cycle lane bit that runs alongside it so you're off the main road which is great but parts of it are tarmac parts of it are gravel parts of it are single lane cycle tracks that have just been relayed so the single lane cycle track that's as i say just been relayed as in they were doing it while i was riding up Right, um, and I got to a bit where 
the, the builders were working on it and they were like, oh, you can't, you can't ride on this bit. We've literally just like flattened it. You can't ride on it. And I was like, okay, no problem. The cycle lane is probably, you know, two bike width wide. So it's quite narrow. So I said, but there's nothing on the sides. It's just like dirt. So I was like, where, where do I need to like not ride on it until? And he was like, oh, you see that roller over there in the distance? As I say, in the distance, you can get back on there. It's probably like mm, just short of a kilometer away. Okay. So there's me like walking with the bike on the side in this little ditch about literally about that wide, getting covered in mud and shit for like a kilometer, just walking along thinking, for fuck's sake. I, I'm just in my head going, they're not going to know if I get on it now. And I look back and they're all watching me and I'm like, they are going to fucking know if I get on it now. Um, so that was, but that bit, when I came back, because I came back the same way, they, they'd, all, they'd done the building work. And it, it's a, the surface is amazing. And it's as a bit of a cycle lane, that is incredible. But then, as I say, the bits of it, which is the old A road, it's, it, the surface is pretty good. But then it just is broken up by massive like gravel sections, which might be like three or four miles long. So riding a road bike, you have this continual like thought in your head going, can I get a puncher? Is the bike gonna survive? Is it gonna be all right? Like you, you know, it's rough. And uh, luckily, the bike got through all of that, thankfully. But then, getting into Abermore, the last, the, the problem with this whole stretch is it was basically a headwind. And the same thing, it was start. This is when the thunderstorm started to happen. Was going through the Cairngorms, and everyone's just like that standard. It's quite high up. You're gonna get bad weather there. It's foggy, misty. And it was a headwind just, and if you look at the elevation on that day, which is day 10, it just goes whoop, and then boom, down. So that drag up was super, super slow, just slow. And I remember doing it thinking, fuck, this is gonna take a long time because it's a headwind. And uh, eventually got to the top, started descending, still a headwind. So you're still working as hard going downhill as you would be going uphill. And then, the very last stretch going into Abermore, because Abermore is like now like quite a no, well-known ski town, apparently, which I was quite surprised about. So that last stretch going into Abermore, you're back on the busy road, which is not ideal, but it's just like, you know, I, I was fucked at this point. So I was like, I'll just deal with it. Like uh, every day, generally, the last 20, 10 to 20 miles, I was fucked anyway, so I didn't really care. Got into the hotel, got checked in. I stayed basically at hotels or B&Bs pretty much every day, um, which logistically is a nightmare to work out. But I was the best way to try and make it as easy as possible for me. I, you know, I just book everything through booking.com because it gives you an itinerary. They've got cancellation policy, all that kind of stuff. It was easy that way. Um, and the, so the big things, every single place I stayed in, I had to check, what's your COVID policy? Can I bring the bike into the room? Can I make sure I can book a dinner for ta a table for dinner, not a dinner for table, table for <laughs> dinner, and can I get breakfast? Some people said to me, like, oh, why aren't you camping and all this kind of thing? And I was just like, I mean, it's just another element which is unnecessary to bring into this kind of challenge. Um, it was hard enough as it was. And so, anyway, I got to the place in Abermore, which on paper looked like it was going to be really nice. I got there, checked in. And they were just like, oh, you can't, you can't have dinner here. I was like, why can't I have dinner? And they basically turned around and said, uh, you needed to pre-book your table like two or three days in advance, not the same day. And I was like, I called up and I checked all this sort of thing out. And I thought, you know, it should be, you know, I thought I'd already sorted that. And they were like, no, 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 you haven't booked a table. And I was like, I'm pretty sure I did, but okay. So grumpy, tired Chris, can't get dinner at the hotel. They were funny about the bike as well. And I was like, I've checked all this. Here's the proof of it. I've checked it's fine. I've specifically requested a room on the ground floor so that's carry upstairs. Anyway, I think because I got grumpy about the fact that they said I can't bring the bike in, uh, they just decided I wasn't allowed to have dinner, effectively. So I was like, okay, so what's, what's my choices for dinner? And uh, they were like, well, you can get bar snacks. You can get stuff from the bar. And I was like, okay. What's the, so what, I went and had a look at the menu in the bar and it was paninis. And, you know... As a vegetarian, that is a tricky thing to deal with when you can only have bar snacks. And the only thing they had was a uh, cheese and tomato panini. So I, had, I had four of them because um, there was nothing else. There's nothing else. And I, that, that sticks in my head so much because food is such a driver on these kind of challenges. And you're really looking forward to a good meal at the end. And 
couldn't have it. Literally couldn't have it. So I was grumpy that evening, which meant I was grumpy the next day, which was the day that I started to go through um, Inverness. Inverness, uh, I actually thought was quite... I quite liked Inverness. It was kind of, it was quite pretty. Kind of cut through the middle of Inverness. And then there's this bridge at some point, which is sort of north of Inverness. And it's by Dornock Fair, is what the bit's called. And going along this bit of road was a tailwind. Is like just to where this bridge was, was a tailwind. But I remember thinking, going across it, I've got to come back across this. The chances that it's a headwind are probably going to be quite high. Um, this could be sketchy as hell because it's a, it's a bridge that crosses like an estuary and it's very exposed, very, very exposed. A lot of wind going between it and the middle part of it, they basically put like big barriers up to try and stop the wind. But the first bit on either side of it is completely exposed. So you can really feel the elements. And I thought, okay, that's going to get interesting on the way back. But this was kind of the point where I started to properly hit the Eastern coast of Scotland and running along the Eastern side of Scotland. So, Day 11 was the day before uh, hitting John O'Groats. And there's a stretch of road, which is pretty much the only road that runs along that bit of coast. And loads of people, I've been told, a lot of people have messaged me saying, like, oh, it's not a nice road to ride on. You know, there's lots of lorries on it. And I was just, in my head, I was like, it can't be that bad. Like, it can't be as bad as riding in London or Australia or anything like that. And it wasn't. I actually, I think it's like people know what they know around them and I, actually i found this like one of the fun most fun bits of road i've ridden on i really enjoyed it because it was kind of just undulating along get your head down ride it like a you know like i would anyway and i just enjoyed it and i was staying in a little b&b that night in a uh, in a little sort of town just outside of it's just outside of the town was called helmsdale and there's Helmsdale is, is tiny and there's not a lot there. There's only one restaurant really in Helmsdale, which I went for dinner at because I was staying at the B&B. The B&B was amazing, made like really lovely people. But the, um, the town only really had one restaurant in it, which was a, a fish and chip shop, basically. I'm, I'm allergic to seafood. Yeah. Walked in. Like, do you know that smell of seafood? Oh, reeked of it. <laughs> Um, but I was like, you know what, I need to, I need to eat. And I ordered, they had a vegetarian burger and chips. And it was literally, the plate was probably that big. Two, and there was no, the vegetarian burger had no bun. It was two vegetarian burgers. And then just this massive salad all around it. And then the bowl of chips came out that was like this. And I was like, nice. this, this is going to be a challenge. <laughs> Good Scottish portions there. Yeah, yeah, it was huge. It was literally the biggest thing I've eaten. Um, but... This is, you know, the weather had been a bit unpredictable to this point. Like it was showers or headwinds or little hailstorms, but nothing, nothing. I mean, it was bad, but nothing as to what was going to happen. Uh, I remember that evening I had the guys, the guys that were doing the film were with me that evening. And um, they were like, oh, we, we might go into the Scottish Highlands and, you know, get some nice drone footage and stuff like that. And I, I remember saying to them, I was, I was tired. Like, every evening I was tired and quite blunt. I remember saying, guys, this isn't a fucking Visit Scotland film you're making. Like, <laughs> you need to make sure that you're capturing, while we're together, you need to make sure you're capturing the hard bits and not just the easy bits. And I was like, this road that goes up to... Um, John O'Groats is, is notoriously a busy road. It's not a nice road to cycle on. So like, that's a hard bit that you should try and capture because it, it shouldn't all just be all like glorious and sunny and nice and everything. You need to make sure you capture the shit bits. And they were like, you make a very good point. We hadn't really thought of that. Um, I was like, yeah, I can tell you what bits are shit because I've ridden them and you've missed this bit or this bit. And it was, I was quite blunt to them, but I was like, you know, for me, it was like, as amazing it is to know this thing is going to be documented, it's so much about making sure that you ca you need to capture the, the, the lows, not just the highs. You really need to capture the lows so people understand what physically and mentally I was going through. As not just thinking, oh, he's just riding across the country. Like At the end of the day, this was to raise funds for an incredible charity and incredible cause. So the more I was suffering, very noticeably, the more money went into the Just Giving page. So anyway... Going back to day 12, I'd had this conversation with the film guy saying, you need to capture the shit. I looked at the weather forecast that evening for the next day, and it was 
biblical, like absolutely biblical. Um, I got up really early in the morning. I get, I was getting up every day at about six. And part of that was this anxiety thing I was saying about really kicking in. I was just waking up super, super early and just like feeling like I need to get ready to get going. And uh, I you know, got changed, got ready, got on the bike, got on the bike probably by about, I think I was on the bike by seven or half seven that day. And this, so this leg was basically from Helmsdale up to John O'Groats and then turning back on myself, um, which is very, very tough to deal with actually. And I think that basically what I did on the turn back was, let me see if I can find it. Day 11, yeah. So the turn back was basically just to turn back just before Helmsdale again like a town ahead of it effectively got on the bike in the morning and I thought okay it's not raining that badly right now it's not going to be too bad I had like arm warmers leg warmers on shoe covers on gilet on and then within the first five miles the heavens really opened as in thunderstorm open sideways rain coming off the sea but there was a tailwind so at least I was being pushed along you know I was like Okay, I'm being pushed along. I, and I, I remember in the morning looking at my uh, phone at what speed the tailwind was. It was a 40 mile an hour tailwind. Uh -oh. It was rapid, <laughs> rapid tailwind all the way to John O'Groats. I got there super, super quick. And then I was very keen to not hang around because it, it was still, you know, showery, still thunderstorm, still hail. And the film guys had got there, met me there, and they were like, oh, we could we just get some like footage and stuff for you being around. I was like, yeah, yeah, that's fine, but I really don't want to be waiting around. And they were like, completely get it. And they were like, why don't you want to be waiting around so much? I was like, well, you know how fast I was here? That was because I had a, a 40 mile an hour tailwind. I'm literally riding the same road back into that 40 mile an hour tailwind, which is now a 40 mile an hour tailwind. <laughs> and they were like, okay, good point. I was like, you guys probably don't like, understand that being in the car like you don't really get a feel for it when you're driving so much you might feel it a bit on the car but it's not the same as if you were cycling it yeah of course and uh that that was an absolute slog that 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 day because it was the when the rain and everything was really hard anyway because as i said like visibility dropped massively i had to have all my lights on put my additional lights on the bike because I had two sets of light, two front, two rear, just to make myself as visible as I could be. Because you know when you get the spray up on the road and it really becomes hard to see a rider. And they actually what was this is a point where that safety aspect became paramount over anything else with the filming, the film guys. And they sat in the car behind me with the hazards on because of visibility. And that was, I didn't ask for that. They they chose to do that. And I'm, I'm very, very thankful for that because it just meant any car that overtook, overtook, overtook safely. Because it's a notorious bit of road for cyclists getting knocked off. And we're already on the, you know, already on a, the downside where the visibility is low and it's awful weather. So the fact they did that was, as I say, that was one of those points where the safety aspect was more important than anything else at that point, making sure the challenge is completed and that nothing bad happens to me, which obviously is going to look shit anyway if it did. Of course. I don't think anyone would begrudge you that. I think if, if any of us were in the same position with you, we'd do the same for you. So. Yeah, it's, you know, you don't want, you don't want to take unnecessary risks at the end of the day. Um, and at this point, you know, I got to, I had on me, so we found iron brew sweets, like fruit pastels, and they were incredible. And like, they're just like super cheap. And like, it was a good, like easy thing to eat on the bike, which is like gummy sweets. Iron brew fruit pastels were like amazing. And uh, I had like a packet of them in the, your little Atticus bag that was on the front of the bike, just had iron brew sweets in it basically. But then I also bought a tablet, like little bits of tablet, which if anyone doesn't know what tablet is, is basically fudge, but like harder. And, it's kind uh, of sugar. It's basically just sugar. It's sugar. Just a square sugar. <laughs> so you could buy a, like a block of it that's about that big for I think it's like ninety pence. Yeah. It was rocket fuel. So that was like riding into headwind tablet, eat that, get on with it. And I just like this is one of those days where you know when, with me when I ride and I have to count down the distance. This was that day where it was mind over matter. It was just like switch off the emotion, 
turn into a robot and just get it done. And then when I stop, the emotion just flooded out as it, as it would, as I think anyone would kind of expect. Mm. And I'd stop in uh, Brora, which is beautiful little town. And I remember getting to the hotel, literally sitting outside the hotel and just crying because it was such a fucking hard day. And emotionally, you know, 13 days into the ride at this point, like my emotions were all over the place. My anxiety was through the roof continually. And uh, obviously the film guys were like, we're glad we didn't go off into the highlands today. And we actually stayed a few days today. Uh, and I was like, good. I'm glad you got me crying and being <laughs> pissed off in the rain. Um, so that was, but kind of from the point of getting to Brora was like, I know that I was kind of, uh, on the way back now so that was a bit of a mental like switch i mean the first that first turn back from john o'groats coming south was hard because it's like i'm riding the same road but also i'm riding home now and that mentally was quite good so at this point i kind of knew that my tires were probably shagged to be perfectly honest uh, you think of the additional weight that's on the bike, it wears, you wear through tires. I've been doing quite a lot of off-roading. So I had it in my head that day that I, I knew sort of 10 days in, I was probably going to buy new tires anyway. But I kind of managed to make them last to day 13. So day 13, which was basically from Brora going back through Inverness and then just stopping in King Gussie, which is a place I've ridden through before. Uh, I had it in my mind that I was going to, find a bike shop around Inverness to get new tires. I needed new tires before Inverness because I had a very, very exciting puncture called Sealand going all over the place. Um, and I mean, I looked at the, t I was, the, rear, the front tire actually wasn't that bad. The rear tire was the one that was knackered and that's because it's got all the weight. It's got my weight on it and all the weight of the gear on the back of it. So you kind of expect it and going off road so much as I had done was to be expected. So I ended up finding a bike shop in a town just before Inverness. And I just went, I basically had to queue up for like half an hour. Uh, they were one in, one out policy. I was like, what tire do you have in a 28 mil that I can buy now to put on this bike? And the only tire he had cost 70 quid. So I was, like, I was like, well, it was a race tire, basically. I was like, I, I just need to, I need to, I need a new tire. This one's buggered. Um, another slight issue that had come up with the bike is the the uh like the stopper in the steerer tube to allow you to compress the whole front end to make your, your headset feel tight had slipped it slipped down into the steerer tube so i couldn't actually get the headset tight and this is just from the relentless off-roading i was doing on a on a bike that's not an off-road bike um so i had to like try and i basically tried to figure out a way of tightening that and it sort of it seemed to have worked um replaced the tire um, went into Wimpy, got a veggie burger. I've never, I've been to Wimpy since I was a kid, but it was around the corner. Um, and then carried on again. So I was slightly delayed this day because of having to sort bits out on the bike, which, as I said, this whole anxiety thing again, going through the roof, because it's like, okay, I'm delaying my whole day. I'm not going to finish now, probably till about seven o'clock in the evening. It's, everything's been set back again. And I knew that from about four o'clock in the afternoon the rain was going to start coming pretty heavy again had a bit in the morning i knew it was going to be pretty heavy again in the afternoon but same thing just got a, just there's only one thing i could do which is carry on riding to go in the direction i needed to go which was south anyway got that day done eventually and then it was basically the ride uh, starting to come back towards edinburgh which i was kind of I didn't really know what to think of it because I was like coming back into, I was still riding the same roads I'd ridden on basically. Um, cutting through Perth, dealt with that dodgy bridge by Inverness again, which was sketchy as hell coming back because it was a headwind. No one really rides John O'Groats to Land's End or John O'Groats South because it's generally always a headwind. And uh, this stretch coming back sort of to uh, Edinburgh was the same thing on that side, pump, that pump track side pool lane I was saying about earlier, the bit of gravel, the bit of beautiful tarmac, the bit of old road, following that I, through the Cairngorms again, through Perth and into Edinburgh. And then I put in some like, apparently some absolutely brutal climb just before Edinburgh, 
which was brutal and that, but very beautiful but it was hammering it down again sideways rain got into edinburgh went over this massive bridge again and i knew when i got to edinburgh i had like a big quite a big crew actually coming into the last bit of edinburgh there was probably six of us uh, a young lad and his dad came out which was really really cool he's like 13 which is really really cool and his dad so i had a really good chat with both of them but rest day edinburgh was rest day and I was so excited for that because I the last that Scottish block was hard, and I knew that the day after Edinburgh, I was seeing you guys. So it was like a really big mental boost. I'd kind of like planned this ride, so it was rest day heavy at the start, but seeing friends heavy at the end. That was like physically, I need the rest days towards the start because your your body's not used to it mentally i need to see friends towards the end because my head's going to be fucked so edinburgh rest day i had loads of people going oh you should go here you should see this you see this and i was like yeah i'm going to look at it all from the bed and look, maybe look outside the window of the hotel and i basically did nothing ate and slept and then um had to like find some uh i don't know i had to get some like random supplies or something at some point i can't remember what to be honest with you but i probably just went for a wonder and found food i can't really remember it's all a bit of a blur but then very much i guess like the the next block is kind of from coming back into england really and then home so i knew that the edinburgh to effectively i don't know you say i kind of guess newcastle ish newcastle in a bit that leg i knew i was going to be seeing you daisy francis jimmy in at some point during the day or in the evening. So mentally, I, it was really good for me. It was really, really positive. Um, I had a day off, so I felt somewhat more recovered. Not really, just a little bit better than I was. Um, and uh, I... The weather, the weather was absolutely glorious, wasn't it? By contrast. Oh, it's, it was interesting. it's interesting hearing that just the few days before were like the biblical days, because it was, what, like 28 degrees or something? Yeah, it was boiling. It was like... Which I mean, I don't know about you, but we, so Daisy and I went out for a ride on the daytime and then met, met you later on. Yeah. Um, and we really struggled. I know that Jimmy really struggled and Francis did just with the heat. They were just like the salt coming off them. Um, and obviously we'd been out a couple of days before, but like nothing compared to what you had. But was that, was that extreme temperature change quite difficult to deal with? Uh, no, because I definitely ride better when it's warmer. Right, I, just, I feel much better in the war when it's warmer. I don't think the temperature mentally it was better for me, but physically it didn't make any difference to how I rode. Um, and I mean, I, I I'll ride whatever the condition is. I don't. I, I think I can kind of like switch that off of allowing it to affect me physically that much. But um, yeah, it was a great day. It was really good. Jimmy and uh, Francis didn't turn up to when we were supposed to meet, and I got a text message from Francis just saying slow down. <laughs> um, so you sent you sent um your live location to the whatsapp group with me and jimmy in yeah and obviously i knew he was he booked these tickets and he was like we're gonna be in we're gonna be in edinburgh or it was berwick i think he was going to and then they were gonna meet you across from there about 10 miles away or something yeah he said we're gonna be in berwick about three hours early but i'd rather be that than be late and he was like so i guess we'll just hang around Ed uh, to hang around berwick we'll get something to eat blah 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 and then we'll head over to the meeting point and then you sent that live location through and I thought, well, you wouldn't have sent that if Jimmy was there and had met him. <laughs> so Jimmy's clearly not there. Yeah. Uh, he wouldn't have any breakfast because he said he was going to eat in Berwick. And I was like, just have some anyway. You don't know what's going to go. No, 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 I'll eat in Berwick. Um, and I thought, oh God, this, is, this has gone so horribly wrong and I don't understand how. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they ended up having to absolutely batter themselves to to catch up to you, right? <laughs> oh, I got a postman. One second. Oh, no worries. Obviously, I'm leaving that in because I think it's funny. Um, <laughs> my postman, I think he hates me most of the time. Um, things turn up about a week later than they get delivered. Um, but yeah, they absolutely battered themselves to turn up, which was brilliant. And... Uh, <laughs> We rode together that day and it was good fun. Like, I just really enjoyed it. Um, it the, was funny 
well because a lot of people um message us and we're like how's chris doing is he absolutely knackered and i was like no he was really fresh and all four of us were knackered me and daisy went on a little ride and francis and jimmy rode with him and we were all shattered because of the it was too hot and you were just like Ugh. i was like that, I think, that is I quite embarrassing. I got to that point where physically i was kind of I was in the rhythm of it, if that makes sense. Yeah. So it wasn't, I don't know, it wasn't too, it wasn't as bad as I maybe, I don't know, I mean, I was fucked. I was still fucked, but I kind of knew how to deal with it. But that day was, I think, was probably one of my favorite. It was the longest day. It was 200 kilometers, but it was probably one of my favorite days because it was, the weather was great. The actual route from Edinburgh down to you guys was stunning. Like, it was yeah. really, be I'd recommend that to anyone to ride it. It's beautiful roads. And then, the next subsequent days were were hard because <laughs> um, it's back going through the uh, like the Yorkshire Dales and then coming through uh, the Peak District again. So the day sixteen, because I left I left your your like around where you were very early. I was staying up the road and I left really early to um, get on the. I came you know came by in the morning to say goodbye and have some breakfast and stuff. Then I just got on the road and carried on. And I remember Jimmy and Fran both Jimmy and Francis text me like not long after going, we're really sorry, we're dicks. We should have ridden with you in the morning, but we're fucked. <laughs> um, that day, I rode the whole day on my own and did the, um, yeah, the Dales. And I had put in three climbs that day and I didn't realize that all three of those climbs were 25 plus percent were long sections of them. So it was brutal. Um, the weather in contrast from the day before was a bit shit again quite overcast, a bit of showers, especially going through the dales, it was pretty naff. Um, I was staying just outside of Leeds that night. And then this is another thing that I knew the next day, so day 17, was like a morale day again. So I knew I was going to see George and Jess. But I also knew I was going to be riding through the Peak District, up some of the big climbs in the Peak District. Um, but it's another thing, one of those situations where it's like morale's good. And now I'm going to see friends. Um, the peaks are just stunning. I, I love the Peak District anyway. And the weather was a lot better than it was the previous day, but not as good as the day when I saw you guys. It's still pretty, it's still quite overcast and a bit chilly. But um, made a point of a, this is like one of those days where I'd stop for lunch early because I wanted to see Jess because she was working. So I went into the cafe she was working in, which is that, that's like that case of like mental brownie points over physical brownie points about like getting to the destination faster um, and the last sort of stretch of this day coming in towards Nottingham was very up and down up and down again and I, the last like 20 odd miles I was proper I was a bit buggered again and just to say like the film guys when I got that puncture that was the last time literally was the last time I saw them and I knew I wasn't seeing them until like the last couple of days and uh, I got that puncher and they looked, sort of looked at me and were like, right, see you later, mate. <laughs> Literally stayed with me until the puncher went before I changed the tyre. Um, but the, so this sort of stretch going into Nottingham, the new 70 pounds rear tyre that I'd bought was basically cooked again. So I was on to, I, was, I knew like the next day, so day 18, I was like, I'm going to have to buy another tyre. Um, which is just like, it's not very good for a tire. And the tire lasts like three or four days. I was just like, no, this is shit. Um, I'm not going to say what brand it was, but let's say it's not a brand of tire that I would normally ride. Um, uh, but it, and if I say that it was 70 quid, that probably helps nail it down a bit of what it might have been. Um, so yeah, like I rode into Nottingham and the bike was like the headset, like just felt loose again. It felt really like uncomfortable. I knew my tire pressure was definitely really low. I was like, it's probably like 30 PSI. Cause I just like, I got to this point where I was like, I just want to get to destination. I knew the rear tire was not holding pressure. It's, it was cooked again, you know, rips and tears all over it. I mean, bear in mind, I just done a load of off-roading again, going through Scotland, got to Nottingham and I sat on the wall of the hotel that I was staying at outside for ages, just feeling fucked. And uh, this woman came and what? met me there. Oh, that was strange. One second, it's our, it's our. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then the woman basically, a uh, lady came and turned up and gave me two donuts. And uh, literally, it just went bump, bump, gone. 
Um, <laughs> and she had a friend who was a mobile mechanic who came very kindly came and just I was like at some point in the day my uh, had another mechanical and basically part of the tail fin this one bolt had come loose and like it's an amazing product the tail fin but this one bolt had come loose and it meant the whole tail fin just went boop like that oh. uh, it's just and it would have come loose because of all the off-roading and stuff like just yeah. these, these things happen the problem was I couldn't I lost the bolt um, so I basically repaired it using a mix of uh, like gaffer tape and cable ties to hold it all together it worked it you know, gaffer tape works very well <laughs> this stuff it's amazing um, so it held out for the rest of the the rest of the uh, the ride that was fine but um, yeah I was really really struggling that day at the end of it I just felt I think it just because it, it was like you know I knew after that there was what three days left after Nottingham three or four days left Three days left after that day. I think it got to a point where my body had just gone, you're done now. You know, you've done, you're done. Um, so anyway, I basically I ran to like Asda and bought like a load of like gaffer tape and stuff to just like bodge, it, to bodge the tail pin together. This uh, lady's friend who is a mechanic came over, bought a track pump and, and she bought like an assortment of bolts to try and see if she had a bolt that would work for the tail pin. Couldn't find one, unfortunately. Um, and anyway, slept like a log, got on the bike and carried on again for the next day, which was basically Nottingham uh, to Peterborough. So this was the point where I started going to the eastern point of the UK to try and tick off the most easterly point. Um, luckily, had a, a chap called Isaac message me. He works in a shop called Mega Bike. Great name. Um, he was just like, oh, if you need anything, just let us know. I'm sure we can sort it out. He's like, I need a rear tire. I need another rear tire. Uh, and I, and I have, I've been thinking about ways to try and make the bike, the, the headset, tighten up again. And my, in my head, the solution was to add some additional spaces in. So because it, the, basically the bung had dropped down into the frame, the addition, it wasn't fully like screwing into it, so it felt loose. So adding the additional spaces, in theory, would mean that you had enough to kind of screw into to get leverage. And it did actually kind of work. So I bought some spaces, bought another rear tire, um, and carried on to Peterborough that day. This is a day where I had quite a lot of people rode with me, but it was it was uh, to be honest, it was just a bit of a blur that day. Not I don't really feel like much happened. I was knackered by this point, and I knew that you know I basically had uh, what two more days at the end of this one. Yeah, eighteen. So from Peterborough, it was in a case of riding basically straight east to the Lowers Croft and then sort of follow the coast round to then uh, where I was staying, which was this really, really lovely little B&B. And the, the guy that ran it was a, just an absolute diamond, absolute legend. And um, that whole day I uh, had Nibs ride with me, which was really, really good. If you don't know Nibs, he's a hot chili ride captain and like a very good friend of all of us. Um, and just a genuinely lovely guy and an absolute diesel engine. Yeah, very strong. We broke, I broke nibs. <laughs> I really broke nibs. Um, we had a headwind the whole day because we were basically riding along that lip of the UK, just riding like that and then going around like that. And um, that stretch like that was just a headwind. And uh, we got, we, he was like, oh, should we stop at this cafe for lunch? And, and this is where the anxiety thing was coming in again. I was like, I don't. I don't want to stop at a cafe because it means we're going to end up stopping for an hour. But I'll pull in and have a look at it. Pulled in, had a look at it, and there's a queue. And I was like, I'm not comfortable stopping here. So we ended up stopping in Tesco's, and Nibs just like sat on the floor, ate, and he just was like grey. He was so grey. And I was like, dude, are you all right? And he's like, no. I need food. I need drink. I need everything. Anyway, he finished the whole, the whole day with me, actually, uh, which was a really good thing for me to have a, a friend at that point because I was – I was feeling a bit shit. I was physically feeling shit, mentally feeling shit. And I had him and I had uh, Rich Mitch, the guy who is the... <laughs> That's his book. <laughs> um, who is an illustrator guy. He did like loads of the illustrations for Team Sky. Uh, he wrote a stretch of it with me. And, you know, he's a firm friend as well. So it was good having friends that day, definitely. Um, but... 
I only had one more day after that, which was basically riding into London with a tailwind. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really nice that stretch of the UK as well, like around Norfolk and that kind of thing, isn't it, by the coast? Yeah, it was really beautiful. And it was like, it was one of those bits of, I've never really ridden that way. It's quite, it's very, very, very flat. But mm-hmm. it's, it reminded me a lot of like the Netherlands, very flat with a, generally with wind. Uh, mm. Loads of windmills, loads of old like, um, like military bunkers and stuff like that. Um, the only yeah. point of reference I have for there is that in a previous life when I was a journalist I got called out to go and do a job up there in, in Lowestoft which was um, the, the trial of a young lad who had swallowed his nan's goldfish and was getting done by the RSPCA which is <laughs> odd uh, and yeah, I had to go up to Lowestoft and spend the day around there for that There's um, not a lot there is there? There isn't a lot there, no. I can remember trying to find lunch somewhere and it was kind of like, I mean, same as a lot of parts of the UK, just kind of like a weird, empty-ish high street, but yeah. a bit in Norfolk as well, and that's quite nice. Crawling. Yeah, and it was quite nice to have ticked off that most eastern point because it looked, it just feels like it, it kind of like, I ticked off so much of the UK and it looked really impressive on a map to see, you know, London to Land's End, going north, then going east, then back into London. And um, it was what was nice about the last sort of like three days was the weather was good again. It was really really nice. Um, the the day going to Peterborough, the weather was you know perfect really. And then same with the the day uh, riding around Norfolk Way, the weather was absolutely perfect. So it's really nice to have the last few days of good weather actually. Um, but as a part of the country I've never ridden in before, I didn't really know what to expect of it. In all honesty, but it was the the second to last. Oh, day was very much headwindy day but I knew that the last day was just going to be a tailwind it literally was that simple it was going to be tailwind back into London I had a lot of people message me going oh you're riding down the side of a uh, you know busy a road on a cycle lane and down the side of a busy a road and and I, I replied basically to people that said that I was like that's not, I honestly I don't mind that like it's the last day I've taken the route is literally the the straightest route to my flat that I can do I mean, this is a thing though. Lund- is there a nice way to ride back into London though, really? Like you're always going to be on crap roads. Yeah, exactly. And um, the last day there was a, I was really concerned about, this was that whole anxiety thing again. I had this big concern during it about too many people coming out. And so I put quite a few posts out on my like social media sort of saying like, if you see that there's six of us, do not join like do not join just ride you know 20 meters off or 20 meters in front wait until someone leaves like please i was really sort of begging for it and um generally i mean it got to the point that there was like two groups of people on the road and i was just like fine like that's fine with me please don't allow it to join because i you know the government regulations are in place we're in a really tricky time with covid anyway uh, and I didn't. I really didn't want it to look bad on anyone. Uh, and at the end of the day, it's a challenge about doing something for a good cause, not about you know making people hate cyclists any more than they probably already do. Um, but yeah, the last day. What can I really say about the last day? Uh, I was fucked, um, emotionally fucked. I probably cried about five times the last day. Once, definitely outside a co-op eating lunch. Um, and just a. I was sore, like I ached, I really ached. I think in the last couple of days, I've got to this point where my body was just like, now we're kind of done now. It's because you know the end's coming. Um, you know, the bike was not feeling great, like it just ridden the, the UK. So the bike was tired, it needed like a proper like strip down and rebuild. I was tired physically. I needed to strip down and rebuild as well. So somebody needs to like whack, uh, oil up the joints again because they were buggered. I don't know what you're going to say there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, the last day was just a bit of a weird blur. I always think with these kind of things, the last days, you, ca- you kind of hype, in the past, you sort of hype it up in your head. And in reality, it's going to be quite an anticlimax. And I think because I've done quite a few of these sort of things now, I knew it was going to be an anticlimax. I knew I was basically going to get to my flat, probably say, you know, thanks to a bunch of people that come and ridden to my flat. Like I stopped it 
in the park opposite my flat. I'd probably be like, get a bunch of people there, say thank you very much for coming out, get an ice cream, go home and get a shower and go to sleep. And that's pretty much exactly what I did. Was I, there's an ice cream truck on the park, went there, got Mr. Whippy, got a double one, because I thought I'd deserve a double one. Uh, sat on the, on the uh, pavement, uh, ate the Mr. Whippy, cried quite a lot. And then uh, went into my flat and got a shower and then fell asleep on the sofa. And that was it. <laughs> yeah, it's a funny thing, isn't it? I think um, you, you do hear it a lot and you'll have experienced it yourself once you come back off these like mammoth challenges, kind of just adapting to regular life again is almost quite tricky because you just got yourself in this mindset to be able to get back on your bike every day and then almost you're not doing that anymore. Yeah, I found it really, really hard, actually, the last... So we're now into the... It's just over two weeks since I finished. And the the first week, I was not... I was like, that's fu- I was fucked for the first week, like mentally, physically, you know, just tired, very... I know, I know it because I, I've, like, listened to the recordings we did last time. <laughs> I'm, I sound drunk in them. Like, I'm really, like, slurry with my words. Like, I sound drunk. And... Um, so I knew like I was, you know, I was exhausted. And then last week I, I started to feel a bit better and I like started like sorting out some work stuff that I needed to sort out and, um, you know, did a couple of spins on Zwift and things on the bike and I actually felt pretty good. But would every single like afternoon I feel shattered again. Um, and you do, the one of the bits that's really tricky with, with all these kind of things is you do get, you know, you do get a massive like low after it's done because it's just you know you've you've hyped up for so long about whatever it is you're doing and then you end up having this massive low because you're just like oh fuck it's fucking done like it's like what's next it's that continual what are you going to do next and that so many people have asked me what am i doing next and i am actually planning something but you know it's like can't you just live in that moment of what's just been done for a bit and then and relish that and you know, understand that, you know, the fundraising page is over £12,000. Like, that's insane. And it's it's only going to go up more when the film guys have finished making the film. Because then people will actually see more of the really shit bits and probably understand it a bit more and understand the logistics of it a bit more. And then, you know, another part of that is for me is, um, you know, it's... The money is one part of it, definitely, but it's the exposure and understanding that Pace is a very small charity. Um, all charities currently are struggling in the UK and internationally because of the current climate we're in. And what was really nice over the weekend, weekend was seeing so many people do virtual marathons. That was great to see because that actually brought in, you know, that's helped to bring in some fundraising to charities that are really struggling. And it's not just Pace, like it's every charity right now where, you know, you think that charities get a lot of fundraising through mass participation events, whether it's the London Marathon, the Ride 100, or, you know, there's hundreds and thousands of these mass participation events internationally. They're the things that help to bring in that additional funds. And doing this challenge was my way of going, how can I bring in some additional funds to a charity that's important to me? And it has. Yeah, and I think that's it. Like it, the the great thing about this challenge is that although you had a few people out with you, really it, the way to join in was to just sort of watch along from home on your journey, and you could feel sort of part of it, which is is the perfect way to do something like this in in this kind of time. But I would say also, I think you've hit the nail on the head there. I think the one of the challenges for you as someone who has an audience and people look in on, it's very difficult for people who are watching from afar go oh great okay so what are you doing next and almost um you almost have to live up to your own hype or live up to this kind of legacy or this momentum that you created but actually as a friend my advice would be maybe you know you rightly so you have to kind of detach yourself from that and actually like do what's best from you for you especially you know you've talked about having a lot of anxiety in this challenge which as far as I'm aware, that's not something that you've talked about bef- before. No, it's uh, not something I've really struggled with. So, I don't know, it's, why do you think that it was, that came up or was was that very unexpected for you or? Yeah, I didn't expect it at all. I think, um, you know, 
you know and many people know in the past I have struggled quite a lot with depression and that was something that very much came up especially in the first 107 challenge towards the end uh I I expected I actually expected that I'd probably end up getting depressed again I didn't expect the anxiety aspect of it and I think that was purely the fact of being physically and mentally tired and then also just the continual like every day the same thing having to you know it, it was always this what if it was a what if this happens what if this happens what if I punch and I can't do this what if what if I'm stuck somewhere what if the weather's so bad it was all these what ifs and there's you know doing it in the UK there's a lot of elements that are in your control but there's also a, still a shit ton of stuff that's out of your control Mm. And, you know, as I say, as I said, so many people have been asking, like, what's next, what's next, what's next? And in reality, right now, what's next is for me is been spending the last two weeks so far recovering, eating well. Like, I've been ravenous. I haven't been able to, I was only this week where I've been able to sort of stop eating so much, you know, trying to start feeling better physically and mentally. So that's like, stop, my body doesn't really ache so much, but emotionally, I've been very much up and down all the time. and. I expected it because physically what I've done is, you know, when, uh, you know, when, so Ken started like putting together all the like the geeky science numbers of it and the amount of like workload and the training stress and stuff is harder than what the pros would have done in the Tour de France. Mm. Um, uh, Pogaccio won the Tour de France in like 85, 86 hours. I'd done 145 hours of riding which is, you know, that's a shit ton more, but also bear in mind that, you know, in the, in the Tour de France, those guys are riding in a bunch where you get, you know, you, you're getting pulled along in a bunch for so much of the day. You're um, getting massages every night. You're getting your food perfectly planned for you nutrition wise. You're not having to carry your stuff. You're getting the recovery time correct. You're not having to think about the logistics. You're just thinking about having to ride your bike. Is a very and also they're pros, they're professionals, they're the best in the world at what they do. Um, and so, understandably, my as a as a you know a pretty normal guy, my admittedly like maybe what some of those challenges and stuff I do are you know they're they're not easy and they're quite you know quite incredible really to some extent. But I'm still quite a normal bloke. Like it's still very very hard physically and mentally. And during the challenge, I'm quite good at shutting that off. It's afterwards is when I start to struggle with it. Yeah, of course. And it's been the same in everything in the past. Mm. I would just say, I mean, don't even think about what's next. I, mean, I, th I think it's, it's easy to feel the pressure to continue to perform. But mm. honestly, like, I think you just need to, what you have achieved is absolutely incredible. And the fact that you've raised over 12 grand for pace is a, a, just such a huge achievement in itself. Like literally, if you stop riding your bike tomorrow, you should feel absolutely so, so proud of what you've achieved. So that, that would be what I would say. You know, I don't think that you should feel any pressure to do anything else actually. Yeah. You tell everyone else to stop saying. <laughs> <laughs> I, I understand it. I do understand uh, why people want to know because it's really, lovely that people want to follow the challenges and support the causes and it I, I think i've always sort of said to yourself and jimmy that what's really important to me is like bringing people on those kind of adventures and being able to hopefully inspire people to have a crack at something similar i'm not saying go and ride the fucking uk i'm not saying you have to do that but like say for example you want to get into bike packing and you're like you're not really sure where to start you know hopefully this sort of thing helps to inspire you to go I'm going to give it a shot, whether that's, you know, even if you're not comfortable with like ride, you know, staying in wild camping or whatever, but even if you like ride to your mate's house and then just stay at theirs, but carry all your stuff. It's like little things like that. And I, that's what I really hope is that people get as much out of, you know, the understanding of wanting to do the charity side of it, but also hopefully it inspires other people to try something a bit different as well. And that, that's kind of the, the really important things for me more than anything. And as to like, you know, what, what I'll end up doing next is, you know, it's very much about like, I feel as I've got older, I've got a much better understanding on how to deal with me mentally. And this just comes from experience of knowing, and I've, I've dealt with me for 30 years now. I know how to deal with me a bit more. And it's got to that point where it's like, I know I need to sort of have a mental switch off just to like 
reassess and then kind of like rejig me to make sure I can do things again. And what has been quite a big surprise and actually a very positive surprise from this whole challenge is that um, physically I've not really had any issues. Like I've not, in the past, I've struggled quite a lot with nerve damage in my hands and you know, my back is something that's been a thing that's plagued me for the last, I don't know, maybe year or so since I got hit by, a, yeah, it's probably, it's just over a year because it was when I got hit by a car just before the National 24 last year. And I've had a lot of problems with my back. And so I've spent a lot of the start of this lockdown period trying to strengthen my back and get it to work in the best way possible. And then with the nerve damage, there's not really much I could do to solve that. That, that was a, another element that came from when I got hit by a car and it was very bad in Australia as in the sense that my hand became like a claw hand like this, perfectly shaped into a shifter. Um, but for this challenge, like there's not much I can do to control it. But what, one of the things I did do, which I did do in Australia is I wrote gloves, I wore gloves the whole time. And I don't really like wearing gloves really, but it's saved my hand. It means I can still do this as opposed to being like stuck in a rigid claw shape. So it's just like being, you know, experience, on how to cope with these challenges physically by doing them is great. And also I think mentally I've kind of got to this point where I'm like, okay, I know, I, I know that I have to have a, just a decompressing period, which could be, you know, a month really. It's fine. I've got plenty of other things to do right now. I've got some wheels I'm going to paint <laughs> and a bike I'm going to paint. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, I think we were going to talk about um, like the biggest challenges. I think you kind of mentioned them as we've been passing, but I guess just sort of briefly, I guess one of the big ones really for this challenge were the, just the logistics associated with COVID-19. So the checking in with, um, not hospitals, what do I want to say? Hotels. The hotels, hotels. Um, and managing people who were coming out to meet you. Um, mechanicals you mentioned the headset yep tired How many did you get uh punctures i think i got probably in total three but they were two of them were bad enough that it was like needing a new tire bad yeah um as in i plugged them because i ride tubeless because i do ultimately prefer it and i plugged them the ease of just being able to plug a tire is so good it's just like boop done but I plugged the punctures and then they were still pretty buggered. Um, but the, the logistics is the hardest bit. It's the, you know, managing people that come out to ride and being able to go, you know, I, if, you, if you can't keep up, I'm sorry, but I need to ride at this pace. So I've still got to get somewhere. And the goal is to get there quick enough that there's enough recovery time, but not too quick that I'm doing damage for the next day. Yeah, that, that is that is that that definitely flared up the anxiety quite a lot. Um, managing other people and also like a big part of it was with people I knew I could very much be myself on how I was, understandably because it's my friends. People I didn't know so much, you know. There's obviously I felt there was a bit of an expectation of what it would be like to ride with me as well, which sounds really weird as a way of wording it, but I think like in my head I was like, oh, that this person is going to expect like me to be really chatty and jolly so I almost felt like I had to play up to that a little bit at points in reality I probably was just no different but it's like one of those things that plays in your head um booking hotels that kind of side of it I booked everything in advance I planned the whole route in advance you know there's there was a lot of time that went into that side of it that you know there was last minute changes hotels that would turn around and go oh you can't bring the bike in or oh we, we're actually going to lock down this area so you can't actually stay here so you need to stay somewhere else that happened once not being able to bring the bike in happened three times where it turns out i had to just like flutter my eyelashes at people and hope and it seemed to have worked in the end so normally when you kind of explain what i was doing and the value of the bike people were actually quite understand um, and then you know route planning i used commute to plan everything which i i really like commute for route planning but no route planner is perfect at the moment that obviously there's always going to be bits of unexpected sections. No route planner has refined it perfectly yet. Um, although I think Kamut is probably the best of them at it right now. The Where it becomes like, you know, you're going to always have unexpected things like 
some of the off-road bits I maybe didn't expect, but I knew the like road. Like the guys doing the tarmac. Pardon? Like the guys doing the tarmac. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like having to walk that section. Like no one could predict that. Um, but what I like about the route, the route planning on commute is you can put it all as a collection and you can see the whole thing and work out roughly how, with the total distance, the elevation, all that kind of stuff. And also the weather aspect on it to be able to know what direction the freaking wind is, mm -hmm. which is this way most of the time. To have all that was really useful. But there's so many elements into these kind of challenges, especially if you're planning it yourself. That's what sets off the anxiety, I think. It's having to deal with all those things, dealing with people's expectations of you, dealing with route planning, COVID, mechanicals, weather, food, food, really hard thing to juggle, especially if you're vegetarian running across the country. Mm. It should be easy. It's not that easy. I think by its nature, a sort of point to point challenge in of this kind is always going to have unexpected things you can you can plan so much and everything else you need to be prepared to sort of roll with the punches which yeah. i guess a level of anxiety around that is is probably quite natural because by its nature it's quite a an unknown beast isn't it really mm -hmm. and, and yeah. it, even if someone was doing it with you like for example you know like trans am or trans continental or any of these events there's lots of people doing it but every every person's journey is completely different based on just what happens to them isn't it so it's yeah. even if you did this seven times the outcome would be different every single time wouldn't it so yeah exactly exactly yeah. yeah it was um i i would say this was the hardest challenge i've done like doesn't there's nothing that comes close to it the first 107 is probably the one that comes closest but that was probably the longevity of it that made that hard but you know, obviously, I'm definitely fitter now than I was then. Um, but, you know, the the thing with that challenge is it was riding the same places. So the, the, what made it tough is maybe the, can, you know, it's like it's mind-numbing riding around Regent's Park or Richmond Park for, you know, four hours and stuff. But this was harder. And then in comparison to Australia, this was twice as hard as Australia. Easily, easily twice as hard, if not more. Because there's, there was, you know, Australia, we were pretty lucky that the only, the only consistent problem was the headwind. The UK, there's a lot of other consistent problems that come into that. Um, and, I, and I've got the, you know, looking at the science side of it, looking at the actual, the numbers and stuff, it was harder than Australia. Like on training peaks, you get like this graph, which goes like this, yeah? And say Australia, the top point of Australia is there. The top point of this challenge is like that. And that's the difference in like how fatigued you are. Mm -hmm. Noticeably different. One of the big strengths of this challenge was that I left my flat and I finished at my flat. So that takes away that travel thing, which we had with Australia of like getting to Australia and then getting back, which is realistically two days of travel either side and you become jet lagged. Um, but yeah, fuck, it was fucking hard. <laughs> it was fucking hard it was let me ask you this why why do it then like what what drives you obviously you're doing it for pierce and you're doing it for a charity but no one's 100 percent completely selfless like what what is it you must enjoy part of it i do i i like the idea of trying the reason why i do a lot of these challenges is there's a couple of things for, for me personally it's being able to see where how i can push myself I really like trying to do that. And whether that was with, you know, the original 107 challenge being so consistent for so long, the national 24s, which are so fucking hard for really quite a short period of time in comparison, because um, you're, you know, racing it. I and mean, you, you came to one last year and you, you it's fast, it's rapid. Um, you know, there's, for me, I don't feel like I've found my limit. And I'm going to continually keep trying to find what that limit is to then work out how to push through that limit. Because I think that that helps to strengthen you as a person, makes you, you know, these kind of experiences wisen you up and make you a better person overall. And being able to physically challenge yourself helps you to also mentally challenge yourself. And that's part of it for me. The other part of it is also, I've not seen so much of the UK and it's like such a, a, it was just too good an opportunity to not explore the UK and 
you know, I'd never really been to Scotland. So it was a great opportunity to go to Scotland. I mean, the weather was shite, but I got to see so much of Scotland, really. And doing it by a bike, you're going at a pace that's like fast enough that you can cover distance. But at the same time, you're going slow enough that you can absorb what's going on around you, that you can smell it, you can taste it, you can hear it, you can see it. You can't do that in a car. You're in a box where you, you have the elements removed from you and you're going super, super fast. So you don't really engage with your environment and your surroundings. So that the, the two things for me, it's the opportunity to, to explore and also the opportunity to challenge myself. And then subsequently from those, I like to hope that it helps to encourage other people to do it. And if, you know, if these kind of things, one, the fundraising is part of it, but two, if it encourages people to try something different that they're not used to. And I, I get, I get a lot of messages and it's really, it's unbelievably heartwarming to get these messages of how like people have decided to do these little challenges, whatever it is, that's when it's a success. And that selfishly makes me feel good, you know, to know that someone's got something out of it, not just the fundraising side of it. No. And it is absolutely very, very inspiring. It makes you want to get on your bike and, and push yourself and find your own limit as well. Mm. Um, and as I said, as of this morning, I think the the total on the Just Even page is over 12 grand. Is that right? The pace? I think it's 12,090 something pounds. Which is fantastic. You should be really proud of that. Congratulations. It's mental, isn't it? Um, and the Just Given page is still open? Yeah, it's uh, keeping the Just Given page open uh probably uh for at least the rest of this year um reason being that i'm i'm there's another project it's not me riding a bike don't worry there's a project <laughs> of a an object which will be raffled off the object is much bigger than this it's more uh like this kind of size how very exciting um it's more that sort of size object um which i'm trying to figure out at the moment really um i'm going to raffle it and how i will do it is um basically i'm going to put a donation point on the just going page and that's going to be like basically any donation of a certain value I haven't worked out yet uh, which will be a raffle entry every donation above this one which i put as my like freeze block line will go into the draw to win said object um i just need to finish painting it nice so Keep going, that's can, um i'm hoping that i will finish paint well so this week i've had to like juggle loads of stuff around anyway as i was telling you before we started recording and i'm hoping that i will finish painting it on thursday and then it has to cure and be like built up and everything so hopefully i'd like to hope around november time hopefully awesome. November, maybe start of December. So someone was a nice Christmas present. Awesome. That's really cool. Yeah. And do you know uh, roughly when the Cervelo documentary might be coming out? So with the Cervelo documentary, we're hoping that will be done by the end of November. And Perfect. Maybe line them up. Yeah. Yeah. The intention is uh, the documentary will be, you know, we can't really do a screening of it or anything. So we're just going to sort of put it out into the wild and, see what happens i think i don't know nice. i'm going to be seeing the guy that's directing it in about 15 minutes so we'll find out then perfect well i mean i think we're sort of um done. is there some sort of link somewhere where if people want to go to the just given page now they can i'll put it in the youtube video here and i will add it into the description of the podcast as well cool right well we'll wrap it up and um leave it there Thank you so much, Emily, for listening to me talk bollocks for a very long period of time now. <laughs> no worries. Uh, hopefully this is an um, interesting way to try and do the podcast as well. So we'll see. We'll find out what people comment, like, and all that jazz. I'm trying to do Francis now. Comment, like, subscribe. <laughs> and also comment, like, and subscribe on the podcast. I think you can on some of them, actually. Depends I have no on the, idea. Depends on the platform. It goes so the podcast goes out to like fifteen different programs. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Like it. Send it in an email. Post it to your nan. All yeah. of that stuff. I don't know how any of it works. I don't do it. Stick it on a post-it note and put it on your forehead. Yes. Why exactly. Not?
Cool. Cool. Okay. Right. Well, speak to you later. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Goodbye. <laughs>